thanks for the opportunity to bring my personal and political solidarity to this brilliant rally and this celebration of socialist ideas, sharing it with such distinguished comrades. And as Sarah's indicated, what better time to celebrate those ideas in the centenary of the Great Russian Revolution. With Donald Trump in the Oval, Oval Office and a Tory government visibly crumbling before our eyes. We are confronted by an economic, and it should always be remembered, an environmental crisis of massive proportions which show the relevance today of socialist ideas, not just to help explain the world, but as somebody once said, to change it. And as Sarah said, as a proud Socialist Party member and the elected Assistant General Secretary of PCS since 2004, I'm proud of the contribution I've made over three decades of work in helping defeat one of the most reactionary <coughs> leaderships in the British trade union movement in CPSA, confirmed... <laughs> confirmed by the recent release of government papers that prove a conspiracy between the Thatcher government and that right-wing leadership to deny a comrade, a brilliant comrade, John McCready, from his rightful place as the elected General Secretary of CPSA. As we counter this threat, we built in the CPSA and followed this through into PCS, a rank and file left, and we won support after many years of struggle for a militant industrial political response to the attacks of successive Tory and, let's not forget, new Labour governments. And I'm proud of being part of a leadership, working alongside comrades like Janice Godrich, John McAnally, Fran Heathcote, Marion Lloyd, working alongside Mark Sawatka and a Left Unity National Executive Committee. And I'm proud of the role that we have collectively played in leading the fight against austerity in recent years. And we've had to contend not just with an attack on the conditions of our members, we've also had to contend with an attack on union rights in the civil service. And our answer to this has been to defy the threat to our union funds by re-recruiting in the mother of all recruitment exercises, members back into the union, and like the RMT and the POA before us, have emerged organisationally stronger and prepared and ready to continue the fight on behalf of our members. And our answer has also been to fight for tax justice, to fight for the jobs and resources in revenue and customs, to collect the tens of billions stolen from the public purse by the super rich as a result of tax avoidance, tax evasion and uncollected taxes. And our answer in the DWP it, as a result of industrial action and political pressure has been to challenge the office closure program and to halt, to call for a halt to the disaster that universal credit rollout would involve. <laughs> our answer, as a result of industrial pressure and a court victory, has been to halt the attempt by the government to massively cut the redundancy payments of our members designed to make it quicker and cheaper to sack PCS members. And our answer, as Sarah referred to, has been a consultative pay ballot with 99% voting to reject the pay cap and nearly 80% uh, uh, voting to take action if the Tories don't listen. With a turnout a fraction under 50%, this represents the best result and most re representative vote we've ever secured in a PCS ballot. And this gives us a decisive mandate to take up the fight against the public sector pay cap, to build with public sector unions through the TUC, we hold them to account, but in parallel, we talk to those unions and build up support that those are prepared and serious about support in a programme of sustained industrial action that will be, ne that be needed to force back such an enfeebled Tory government. To finish, comrades, the election of Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader. The popular support for the election manifesto, I believe, marks a turning point in British politics. 
But to rebuild the power of British unions is to follow the example of the RMT, defending public safety on the railways. Yeah. The magnificent... Turnout, the 74% of C postal workers in the CWU who voted in support of industrial action to defend their rights as workers, and they deserve, and whatever the delays as a result of the, Mr. Justice Sufferstone's court judgment, they deserve and can expect the solidarity of the Socialist Party and organised working class in Britain today. <laughs> organised historic, the first ever strike in Britain of McDonald's workers fighting for £10 an hour and the right to unionise in the fast food industry. But it's not just the consistent day-to-day -day struggles of trade unions to counter the vast imbalance of wealth and power between capital and labour. It is about offering an alternative to a failed capitalist system and offering the vision of a socialist society. Thanks for listening. Well, well thank you very much. Um, I, I walk from King's Cross with Tony Sonwa and Tony and I go back quite a long time. I, I've been a member of the party for 43 years. In fact, when I first joined the Labour Party and I was in the Labour Party Young Socialists, I'm afraid I used to regard people like Jeremy as a Nambi Pambi Pig or reformist. <laughs> so, 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 and, and I've, I've, I've had a message today from an, an old friend and comrade from Gateshead, uh, John Hurd, who now lives in Northern Spain, who used to be the national chair of the Labour Party Young Socialists, and he's telling me all the things I should apologise for for the 30 years <laughs> where I've been a, a Labour Party member during you know, all, all, that, all that era. I'm going to apologise for one thing to John tonight. And that is the day that we were fly posting in Newcastle. And I was holding a bucket in the paper and he was pasting the paper bucket for the demonstration that was coming up anyway. Anyway, I caught out the side of my eye two policemen walking towards me. And I handed the bucket and the bush. <laughs> and I was off. <laughs> You'll forgive me, but like John was actually a very good runner. He ran, <laughs> so I, I, I knew that you would have an advantage from that perspective. So, John, I'm sorry for that. Right, I'm sorry for that. I, I still, I still remember, remember it fondly, and I still giggle about it. So, anyway. so comrades, can I say what a great privilege and pleasure it is to come and address you uh, this evening? And we, we, we meet here tonight, comrades, during an exciting period in the history of the socialist and labour movements in this country. The snap election earlier this year shone a floodlight on the inequality in our society. And while Theresa May stood on the steps of Downing Street and declared her need for a larger majority to silence her opponents as if it was going to some sort of foregone conclusion at the general election, she forgot about one important detail and that was she was a Tory. <laughs> so while Mrs. May toured uh, lifelong Tory heartlands in a bus, uh, meeting groups of people, most of whom had just got off the bus by the way, um, promising a hard right Brexit, with <coughs> arrogance rivaled only by a counterpart across the Atlantic, Donald Trump, her top aides gathered in Tory HQ to mastermind one of the worst manifestos in political history. And whoever thought that promising to remove property from the core voter through the dementia tax would be such a very, very unpopular thing to suggest. So comrades, for those of you who've ever been into the Palace of Westminster, you would see there straight away and recognise the self-entitlement which, which oozes from so many Tory party MPs. And the calling of the election and the subsequent manifesto almost for them became the perfect storm. So let me be clear, socialism and socialist ideas within the Labour Party are not just about Jeremy Corbyn, but without the, without the election of Jeremy, we would never have achieved what we did in June as a movement. The Labour Party manifesto didn't promise a hard left Marxist revolution. By the way, and as an aside, 
I got up off the train, I had my manifesto to wave around here tonight as a prop, right? And I actually got up to go to the loo, and when I came back, my iPad was still there, but my manifesto was <laughs> So the manifesto didn't promise a hard left Marxist revolution or the creation of a communist state. It's much simpler than that. 126 pages of main, mainly mainstream social democratic um, policies. But because that manifesto brought all of those policies together in one document, it all of a sudden became very popular. I mean, the nationalization of the railways and water isn't revolutionary, it's mainstream Western European <coughs> social democratic policy. But it's not felt like that in this country because the political spectrum in this country has so moved so far to the right over the last three or four decades. But in the Labour Party now, nationalisation is no longer a dirty word. And guess what? Socialism isn't a dirty word either. There is Nothing radical in insisting that vital industries are taken back into public hands. Comrades, we're in the absurd situation where our railways, the vast majority, are, 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 are so called privatised, but are owned by state owned transport subsidiaries from Germany, France, Italy, and the Netherlands. The Tories believe in public ownership. But what they believe in is German, Dutch, French and uh, Italian public ownership of our assets. Can you imagine for one moment Angela Merkel overseeing that from a German perspective? Not on your nelly. We have failing franchises on our railways, uh, and, and, but they are nationally owned by neighbouring governments, making vast profits while this government tells us that nationalisation doesn't work. Comrades, the hypocrisy of the Tories absolutely stink. Now, there have been more resignations this week from, the, from this week in the <coughs> cabinet and in the last seven days um, than there have actually been government debates on issues about what's happening in this country in the Commons. In the last four days of, of, of Commons activity, Thursday, Friday, Monday and Tuesday this week, there hasn't been a single item of government business brought forward. We've actually got a government who are governing but not legislating. And that's how they want it because they dare not bring any meaningful legislation forward because they're not convinced that they can get it through. Comrades, this government isn't on the verge of crisis. It isn't about to collapse. It is collapsing and it is in crisis. Theresa May dare not bring any meaningful business to the Commons for fear of re rebellion or defeat. And comrades, it's becoming abundantly clear that Theresa May remains in place because even our own fiercest opponents know that any leadership challenge would lead to a civil war in the party. Ian Duncan Smith said as much on the radio on Thursday morning when asked by John Humphreys uh, uh, who, who should lead the party, he said Theresa May, which is the only one that can keep the party together. Now if that isn't subtext for saying a leadership election would cause a civil war, I don't know what is. So, and can we actually see a situation where they do... ...from Sindicat de Estudiants and Esquerra Revolucionaria, the ones who sent uh, fraternal and revolutionary greetings from all the youth and the workers that have been mobilizing in Catalonia during these past weeks. Uh, revolutionary greetings from the youth that have been in the forefront of the defense of our democratic and national rights. We are living through historic moments and decisive events marked by, by the mass and peaceful mobilizations. People uh, tired of the rule of the Spanish Cat and Catalan oligarchy have filled the streets to fight against those who impose austerity and oppress us with their <coughs> policies. The first and the 3rd of October, the day of the referendum and the day of the historic uh, general strike in Catalonia, there was something that was shown, something that is really, really important. Um, it was proof who has the power, the capacity and the determination to change things. It was proved that with mass mobilization, uh, of course, we can defeat an unjust law and it doesn't matter how many times the state tried to forbid the referendum or how many policemen they sent us. 
Through mobilization, we can shake bourgeois legality, the monarchy, and the front race government of the PP. I'm sure that all of you have seen the images of the last past few weeks of the repression of the Spanish <coughs> government against the, the Catalan people. Uh, for, for, so, uh, for any so-called democratic country, it should be a shock seeing the police entering with buttons at the polling stations or seeing how activists are arrested for sticking a uh, poster asking for the yes vote in the referendum or see how the government is closing uh, different websites. But for the Catalan people and for the youth, uh, is a direct return to the Franco regime when the Catalan language and the Catalan institutions were forbidden. We are not saying that the, that the PP government is applying a Francoist repression because we have a good imagination or because we like uh, the term. We say it because when we see the um, democratically elected Catalan government in prison for their political ideas, uh, or when we hear a PP minister saying that the Catalan children must be Spanified, uh, the only thing that we can do is think of the dictatorship that the PP government misses uh, so much and the images of that period that our parents and grandparents have told, uh, have told us about so many times. And as we've seen in the most important revolutionary period in Catalonia historically, uh, and because national oppression, of course, is something intrinsic to capitalism, the fight for the national liberation today is linked to the fight for socialist improvement against a system where a few have everything and the majority have nothing. Of course, we see that revolutionary potential in the movement. That's why we are defending it and we are building it uh, with Sindicato de Estudiantes and Esquerra Revolucionaria and we are building also the solidarity of all the workers <coughs> of the Spanish states. We organized four general student strikes in a month. The first one, the first strike uh, of the 28th of September where 150,000 people marched in, in Barcelona. of the general strike as a method of struggle on the agenda of the movement and leads uh, to the general strike of all the workers and students of the, of the 3rd of, of October. But all of this that I'm saying, it doesn't mean that we subordinate ourselves to put them on a right-wing politician or, or to the Catalan capitalism, the same Catalan uh, ruling class that have provoked uh, misery, that have implanted one of the highest university fees uh, of Europe in Catalonia, or that had made uh, Barcelona uh, the city with most evictions per day in the Spanish state. Uh, due to its loss of support, the Catalan capitalist and its traditional uh, party has seized uh, upon a genuine, as a genuine aspiration of the Catalan people for independence and has used it in an opportunist way. But the movement is not just Puts the Moon or the Catalan bourgeoisie. This movement is millions of people fighting for the right to decide their own future and against a corrupt, a corrupt system. Because we know and the people in the movement are drawing that same conclusions that no parliament or judge or individual is going to give us anything that we don't win before in the streets. Precisely. Uh, this revolutionary potential is what makes the bourgeoisie, the, the European, the Spanish, and the Catalan start to fear campaign, the campaign of economic chaos against Catalonia and the Catalans to send a clear message that things cannot be changed and trying to end and humiliate uh, the movement. We understand, of course, that position of the bourgeoisie, but what is really, really sad and shameful is that the leaders of the left parties are repeating exactly the same Spanish nationalist prejudices of the bourgeoisie and they are constantly promoting their campaign. We are not just talking about PSOE, the so-called uh, socialist party that has nothing to, uh, to do with this socialist party, uh, uh, the PSOE that has uh, that have defended the repression uh, with enthusiasm, but also uh, other left organizations in the Spanish state like Podemos or United Left or the leaders of the trade unions that are hiding from, from the movement. They are promoting the confusion and the opposition to the movement through the Spanish state. They are comparing the repression of the PP, uh, of the PP government uh, to, to the mass movement in Catalonia, they say that one is as bad as, as the other. 
Uh, and we know that to end the Francoist repression, uh, we need to strengthen uh, the unity between those people who see independence as a way to end with everything that the PP government represents and those that who uh, do have not. Um, there's a sector of the world between the working class uh, in Catalonia, which is skeptical about independence because they see Puigdemont uh, in, in the leadership of this, of this process. But we saw this unity, the 1st and the 3rd of October, and we need to strengthen this unity because the working class has to be the leading force of this movement because it is a question or, uh, of life or death. This is the reason why we, are, why, why we make a call to all the youth and the workers, not only in Catalonia, but in the whole Spanish state, to not get intoxicated by the campaign of capitalism. This is the reason why we are defending the right of self-determination for Catalonia, not only in Catalonia, but in Madrid or in other zones uh, in Spain, because we understand and we know that all these attacks are not just one attack to the right, to the side in Catalonia, or an attack just uh, to Catalonia. Comrades, this year is also the 40th year anniversary of the mass pickets and demonstrations that took place in solidarity with migrants, mainly women workers in the heroic Runwick dispute. struggle, they learn very quickly the lessons on how to struggle, the strength of the working class and become key fighters in the trade union movement. The refugees living in Britain are amongst the most oppressed in our society. It often takes many years for refugees to be accepted, for asylum seekers to be accepted by the system as refugees. And until then, they are denied some basic rights, such as the right to work or study. But at the same time, the right-wing governments are encouraging private multinational companies that run detention centres to make them work for a minimum of one pound per hour, creating cheap labour for greedy bosses. Refugees are amongst those that in one hand have everything to lose because they can be deported back. But on the other hand, they have nothing to lose because they cannot live on the condition they are at the moment. And that's why we're asking for your support and launching a very important campaign, Refugee Rights. This campaign is organised by refugees themselves and has participated in national demonstrations and protests relating to free education, anti-racism and for the closure of detention centres. <coughs> by taking part in the movement, they learn that the fight for their right is connected to the struggle of the working class people in Britain. Their key demands include for the right to work at a living wage, for an affordable home, for free education and for an NHS free for all. But most importantly, the right to join a trade union and to get organised. We request your support for, um, for your support for the trade union movement to win the demands for this campaign. You should all have a copy, you should all have a copy of the motion that you should, uh, should that be given out. And we, we ask you to take it to your trade union branches regionally and nationally, and get the TUC to have in its policy that the asylum seekers have the right to work. Comrades, history is in the making, and to remember this launch, I ask the refugee right campaigners and their supporters, including Tamil Solidarity and the Socialist Party, to hold up the banners with the demands. Because we are confident that this will be remembered. Comrades, we don't live in the past, we have to learn from the past. Learn from the victories of working people everywhere and ponder also the defeats. But above all tonight, we are celebrating the Russian Revolution and the enormous lessons that can be learned from that, the single most important event in human history up till now for the struggles of the working class
today. Even today, it's difficult to look at the Russian workers, half-starved, three years of a terrible world war, with five million dead or wounded, <coughs> and they made a revolution, completed the revolution in October, November 1917. And whereas tomorrow, the people will be marching in London to the Senator on Armistice Day in 99 years, celebrating, if you like, or marking 99 years of the First World War. By rights in Russia, that date ended the World War. One year before the terrible slaughter was complete in that World War. And look at the way the Russian workers threw back the capitalist invaders who tried to overthrow it, throw them. At one time, the capitalists who invaded Russia controlled 90% of the territory of Russia. They fought back and they won and they created a workers' state that appealed to the workers, workers throughout the world, detonated revolutions throughout the world. Russia, in isolation, was not ready for socialism. We had Paul Mason in The Guardian a few days ago arguing really that it was utopia, that the leaders of the Bolsheviks made a terrible mistake by going for a revolution in Russia because that could not succeed unless it spread to other countries. But when Lenin arrived at the Finland station, he chose his words very carefully. He said, I greet you as the vanguard of the coming world revolution. In isolation, Russia, in an undeveloped country, was not ready for socialism. Marx pointed out long ago, you had to hire, have a higher level of production and technique before you could start the beginning of the transition towards socialism. But Lenin and Trotsky saw that capitalism was breaking at its weakest link and could unleash a mighty wave. And when Paul Mason lectures from a hundred years back, if you like, that they should not have taken power, why? Because the German Revolution didn't take place, but it did. Or the Hungarian Revolution, or the Chinese Revolution later. No, those revolutions took place and they were betrayed by the right-wing social democratic leaders of the working class itself. Now we find that the revolution and its lessons are ignored, are just ignored by the capitalist press and by the media. And that's because revolution is on the agenda and, uh, because of the repercussions of the crisis of 2007-2008. Let us remember, not an age ago, but six years ago, the mighty revolution in North Africa and in the Middle East when the, the despots were overthrown, like the Tsar was overthrown in Russia more than a hundred years ago. We saw the same reaction to revolution, to the threat of working people moving to, into action in Liverpool in the course of the struggle that our comrades led. And they used the same kind of scare tactics then. At one time our opponents, the Liberal Democrats, issued the leaflets and said, the Pope is opposed to you. <laughs> the Holy Father is threatening to excommunicate you if you dare to carry out a campaign against the cuts in Liverpool and set a needs budget. That's the level at which the propaganda was. We shrugged off that and we created the massive achievements of the immortal 47. And when Thatcher visited Liverpool and tried to negotiate with us, we defeated Thatcher in the poll tax. And we said to Thatcher what Trotsky said to the Mensheviks in October 1917 when they voted against the revolution, Go, go into the dustbin of history. It is this party 
again with the mighty army of the non-poll tax payers that carried through the removal of Thatcher herself. The refusal of the right-wing Social Democrats to seize the opportunity to take power and follow their Russian brothers and sisters, for that the working class of Germany and in Spain, let us remember, who took nine-tenths of the country in the marvellous movement of the Spanish Revolution between 1931 and 1937. They paid with that for the dark night of capitalism itself. And why did the Russian Revolution triumph? Two words, four words in reality. It was the Bolshevik Party and the leadership of Lenin and Trotsky. No compromise with the capitalist enemy. That would be a very good slogan for Jeremy Corbyn and the leaders of the Labour Party and the leaders of the The Russian Revolution is a marvellous example in many spheres of the struggles of the working class, as our comrade Corral has demonstrated here today. Because the Russian Revolution did not just deliver land, bread, peace and freedom. It gave the right of self-determination to the multinational peoples organized in the Tsarist Empire. 57% of whom were oppressed nationalities. 43% were Russians. And let's they are not a product of conspiracies, as the capitalist media would, would seek to uh, convince us. It arises from the objective process on the capitalism, and from, for, for, the, for definite factors being present in order that a revolution can be carried through. They were described by Lenin and Trotsky in the following way. One, there should be a massive division in the ruling class who cannot rule in the old way. Three, the middle layers of society are in ferment and are moving towards the left. Four, three rather, the working class... <laughs> I've got my numbers mixed up, you get the drift. <laughs> The working class must be prepared to go to the end in a struggle against capitalism. And number four, that they need a mass party and leadership that's capable of providing the necessary guidance for them to take power. If you look at the world today, are not those factors present at the moment? With the crisis of 2007-08, a devastating crisis, from which capitalism has not been able to uh, escape. It left in its way 10 million workers in Europe and America expelled from the factories. It led to a depression in southern Europe in Spain, in Portugal, and in the other countries of southern Europe itself. The youth of these countries have been scattered to the four corners of Europe and the world. That is a crime in my book a crime against the future, a devastating blow to the youth, the most decisive section of society itself. And the so-called boom that is taking place today is mostly in the pockets of big business and not in the reality of the lives of working class people itself. Inequality, which is a big issue in the news today because of the so-called paradise papers. And what that reveals is paradise for the rich and misery and suffering for us and working people throughout the world. <laughs> but inequality is woven into the very foundations of capitalism. We are regaled every day in a blizzard of facts. These, these revelations are just the latest about the conditions that affect our class. This is not tax evasion or avoidance. This is theft on a gargantuan scale. <laughs> and we say here tonight to Jeremy Corbyn, unbelievably, you were invited to the conference of the Confederation of British Industries. Why? To have a tate-a-tate? 
<coughs> to have a cup of tea, as John MacDonald said, he does on his tour of the city. What were you doing at the CBI, Jeremy? I'd say this to our friend Ian, if he was here tonight. If not, to say to them, we've seen in, the, in, the, in these papers, we've had a little glimpse of the reality of capitalism. We want you to open the books to inspection, to trade unions, to working people as a whole. Let's see what the real situation of capitalism. You pay your taxes. You don't do that. We will expropriate the 150 that that leaves. There is a massive revolt of working people today, shown in the contributions that have been made in the RMT, in the post office workers, and so on. There is a massive split in the ruling class on the world scale. I believe that the ancient Greeks invented the phrase, those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first make mad because they knew that Donald Trump was likely to be made president of the US. He might destroy us all with another maniac in North Korea in a, new, new, in a, new, in a nuclear conflagration. What a marvelous contrast it is the example of Sharma Savant in the US, the first socialist councillor in a hundred years in the city of Seattle, and the tremendous campaign and the victory of our comrade Ginger in Minneapolis in the last couple of days. It's a harbinger of the mass movements to come. And who knows, they may make the American Revolution before we do in Britain. Let us hope that that is the case. But there's one thing will come out of the, these developments. Trump could split the Democratic Party and two sections could stand against another. Equally at a certain stage, there will be a split in the Democratic Party. They no longer represent the real interests of working class of America like the Liberals no longer represented the working class of Britain and they would then form their own party, the Labour Party. And under Blair, they didn't represent the working class either. Now there's been a, a step towards the left. The Tory government is hollowed out. The Tory party could collapse. You had on the television this week you had hassle time admitting he may be driven to vote in favour of Jeremy Corbyn <laughs> because the Tory party is in ruins and is conflicted over Brexit. I'll, I'll, I'll see it when I believe it. Because out of the other side of their mouth they're talking about the danger of a Corbyn government coming to power. Not that they're worried about the right wing of the parliamentary Labour Party. They are no danger to capitalism. They are the fifth column of capitalism in the Labour Party. Russian Revolution. As other speakers have said, today we again live in an era of historic social upheaval, revolutionary and counter-revolutionary struggle. On both sides of the Atlantic, we see the credibility of the ruling elite and their political representatives lying in tatters with young people on every continent beginning an era of revolt. Catalonia is an excellent example of this and we see the tremendous movement for independence that is also linked to the fight against austerity. Coral's words this evening were inspiring 
as has been the work of the young comrades there in the student union. In the United States, young people since the Occupy movement have begun a serious questioning of the society that they see around them. And now, the central question facing millions of working people and young people in America today is, how do we bring down Donald Trump, the Trump that the Greeks supposedly wrote about? <laughs> how do we defeat him and drive the whole regime out of power? And even more, how do we make sure that we defeat the right wing? When Trump was elected last November, our organization, Socialist Alternative, called immediate protests for the day after the election. And even though there was a mood of demoralization and shock, while the Democratic Party establishment was completely paralyzed, Socialist Alternative mobilized 50,000 people on the streets. The very next day. anti-immigrant, anti-worker, misogynist, racist agenda has no mandate. The day after inauguration this January was the largest single day of protests ever in U.S. history with three million people marching in the women's marches. That was soon followed by the tremendous airport actions in uh, response to Trump's attempted Muslim travel ban. And among all those airports that saw actions, one airport, the SeaTac Airport near Seattle, saw a shutdown of the airport, and that was because of the leadership of the <laughs> And while the right wing has been emboldened by Trump's election, enough to call their own rallies and marches like in Charlottesville, the response, the counter-protests against the right-wing ideas have been even stronger. In Boston, Socialist Alternative led the way in forming a coalition of activists that mobilized 40,000 people on the streets to stop the right-wing from marching in the city. serious lessons and one of those is that protests alone will not be enough to bring down Trump and the ideas of the right. We're seeing Trump's administration go into complete crisis mode month after month. The investigation by Mueller into Russian interference in elections, the indictments of Trump's former campaign aides, and his completely unstable behavior and his saber rattling against North Korea, which we all know, if ever came to fruition, would be dangerous and disastrous. And there have been calls for impeaching Trump. But despite all that, what we've seen missing is any in motivation or leadership from the Republican and the Democratic establishments. The Republicans don't go after Trump because of fear of writing their own political obituaries because Trump's base is still intact. And they, at the same time, fear to be too closely associated with Trump either. At the same time, the Republicans are caught in the vice grip. And at the same time, the Democrats also don't call or organize for impeachment because they worry about the damage to the whole establishment, to their own system, to the prestige of American capitalism and the office of the presidency. And they also cynically want to make use of Trump in office as an easy target to get the votes in next year's midterm elections. Then they do this, and this is why it's cynical, because they do it in spite of the real dangers they know that Trump's continued presidency poses to working people, but especially to immigrants, people of color, and oppressed communities. So it will take a mass movement to bring down Trump. It will take the working class of America moving onto the stage of history. 
We're going to need to build a powerful, highly organized mass movement, and that is a central challenge that faces, faces us in America. But we are also seeing some extreme bright lights of hope since Bernie's campaign. Look at the rapid growth of the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA. From 6,000 members before the Democratic primary to 30,000 today, it is now the biggest organization in the U.S. that is organizing under the banner of socialism since before the 1960s. And our organization, Socialist Alternative, has also seen huge growth. In Minneapolis, as Peter mentioned earlier this week, Socialist Alternative candidate Ginger Jensen won a historic vote in defeat there was victory for our race for city council. Ginger and our comrades there set the stage for our election campaign in Minneapolis by winning the $15 minimum wage for Minneapolis this summer. politicians in Minneapolis City Hall said 15 was too high. It was not within the purview. It completely demoralizes and dehumanizes them. So we are demanding that the establishment stop the sweeps of homeless people. But we are also demanding that the council tax big business like Amazon to fund the building of publicly owned affordable housing. And in this campaign, while there are many activists who are leading the way, it is also important to note that without the lead of socialist alternative and other radical activists, we wouldn't have come as far as we have come. Comrades, just on November 1st, we carried out an incredibly successful, peaceful civil disobedience action by occupying City Hall, hundreds of activists occupying City Hall all night, and we didn't have the police harass us. That was because of the power of the movement. The establishment is feeling the pressure. And when I go back to Seattle tomorrow, we will see what we can win. What we can win will be on the basis of mobilizing hundreds of genuine self-sacrificing activists. And what we lose will be an, a reminder for us of how far we still have to go and, bu and build this movement. And it's happening all across America. Just days ago, a thousand young immigrant activists walked out from their schools and occupied the U.S. Senate building, demanding that